Let's see, we have some people joining us already. We'll uh, be starting the call here in just a few minutes. So we just have a few slides to scroll through as, as people log into the call and then we'll start our presentation shortly. Thanks for being here today. And in the meantime, if you've served in the military, uh, please share in the chat box if you're comfortable, uh, your branch of service and era of service. Uh, and if you're affiliated with a veteran service organization, just please share the name of your organization. For everyone just joining us, welcome to this month's Empath Health Veterans Briefing. We'll be getting started in just a few minutes. Uh, in the meantime, if you've served in the military, uh, just please share in the chat box if you're comfortable, your branch of service and era of service. And if you're affiliated with a veteran service organization, please share the name of your organization. Let's see here, chat box. All right, so, so it looks like the chat box is disabled, Trudy. Uh, would we be able to get that activated? That's a good question. Let's see here. Apologies for any technical difficulties. Melissa is out of the office today, so a tool and I are <laughs> <laughs> doubling down on the um, on the back of the house. So I don't see that, but the Q&A is um, showing to be active. Hang on, hang on. Yeah, let me, let me go into chat. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, there's not an option there. Chat previews. Hmm. Yeah, I think um, we'll probably just have to have everything in the Q&A section. Yeah, so if anyone wants to share their information in terms of their branch of service or era of service, uh, or if they're with a veteran service organization or any questions, if you just wanna go ahead and use the Q&A feature, uh, it looks like that's uh, activated. Our apologies for that technical difficulty. Technology is great until it's not. <laughs> Perfect. Well, thank you all for being here today. My name is Trudy Beeler. I am the Veterans Community Partnership Specialist for Empath Health and Suncoast Hospice. Um, these briefings, we're proud to bring them to you every month uh, to touch on a variety of different veteran-centric, typically healthcare concerns or issues, um, and try to present uh, resources and support, not only through the VA healthcare system, but also from community partners. So um, this topic is kind of near and dear to my heart. Um, a lot of us uh, on the presentation side of things today um, are out in the community meeting veterans at various uh, veteran coffee events that we host through Empath Health. And oftentimes one of the biggest complaints for our veterans that we meet is, is hearing loss and tinnitus concerns. And um, we've worked very closely with Tony, um, who's presenting today through Florida Department of Veterans Affairs to connect veterans um, to see if they may qualify for um, disability 
payments through the VA as well as um, eligibility through the healthcare system. So um, hearing loss and tinnitus is unfortunately uh, a pretty common ailment for our veteran population and we felt it was very important to uh, do this presentation today, um, not only to the veterans in attendance, but for those that work and serve veterans in their professional capacities so that you can understand how to um, connect veterans to these services if needed. So. Without further ado, I'd like to in, uh, introduce Dr. Charles Truluck with uh, VA Bay Pines Healthcare System. Um, and he is going to give us an overview about hearing loss and tinnitus and programs and support from the VA healthcare system. And his presentation will then be followed by Tony Marconi with Florida Department of Veterans Affairs. Um, and he'll be looking at how to file a disability claim. So we will hold all Q&A until the end of both presentations, just in the, um, for time's sake, uh, so that we don't lose any content. And I'm sure both providers will be um, available for any further follow-up questions or be able to direct you to where to follow up if needed. So without further ado, Dr. Truluck, if you'd like to introduce yourself and we'll get started. Hey, thank you, Ms. Beeler. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Charles Truluck. I'm an audiologist with the Department of Veterans Affairs, uh, Bay Pines VA Healthcare System. Uh, I currently work out of the Lee County VA Healthcare Center uh, in Cape Coral. Uh, I'm the audiology section chief for our Southern Region of Clinics. Uh, I am also a uh, veteran served in the Navy for seven years. And, and I also meant to mention my VA service uh, as an audiologist. I've been doing this for about 21 years or so. So I'd like to thank again, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Beeler and Empath Health for uh, reaching out to our service and giving us the opportunity to meet with you today. Uh, I'd also like to thank each of you for taking the time to join uh, today's monthly briefing. It's always a pleasure. Uh, and an honor to work with and serve the veterans. And I thank each of you for your service. Um, my presentation today will consist of uh, an overview of auditory disorders, uh, including hair loss and tinnitus, uh, as well as other disorders we encounter uh, as audiologists working within the VA and, and other settings as well. So uh, I'd like to first start to give you a very brief um, uh, review of the anatomy of the ear. So if we could go to the next slide, please. And I'll try to keep this brief. I know uh, you didn't sign up for an anatomy lecture or so, but I'll make it kind of short and sweet for you. Um, it's always fun as audiologists. We like talking and talking about the ear a lot. So um, the human auditory system consists of the uh, outer and middle and inner ears you see in the uh, slide there. So the parts to the left, the outermost is uh, the outer ear consists of the penna and the ear canal and the eardrum. So the penna is the visual portion that we see looking around on, on the side of the head. You can, that's uh, the, again, the outermost portion. Uh, the ear canal is a little farther in and the eardrum is, is, is at the end of that. So the penna, again, being the visual, visual appendage on the side of the head, it's the primary job is to collect or funnel sound waves and channel them down into the uh, ear canal. In the ear canal, as you see, it's a, a tube-like channel that runs from the penna uh, inward to the eardrum. And then the eardrum itself is a fibrous, flexible uh, round structure at the end of uh, the ear canal that separates the ear uh, canal from the uh, middle ear space. So in the next, the next uh, part of the ear will be in the middle ear. So the middle ear is actually an ear-filled cavity on the inward side of the eardrum. Uh, it contains what we call an acicular chain of three very tiny little bones, the malleus and the incus and the stapes, if you see labeled there. And I hope that slide is big enough. I tried to expand that as much as I could. Um, but the malleus, incus, and stapes, also known as the hammer and the amyl and the stirrup um, by their shapes. Uh, the first bone in the chain being the malleus attached to the inner surface of the eardrum. The, the next in line would be the incus, and the third down farthest to the right there is the uh, stapes, the smallest of the three. Uh, and then finally the inner ear, uh, farther in from the middle ear, uh, the inner ear is uh, basically a hard encased, bony uh, encased, fluid filled structure called the cochlea. And when we see that, a lot of people, you know, they notice it's spiral shape and it has 
is kind of a snail shape in appearance and it contains very frequency specific or what we refer to as uh, tonotopically organized structures and features internally. The structures are primarily uh, membranous uh, structures, flexible, uh, which interact with tiny hair cells which line the inside of that cochlea. So uh, to kind of tie it all in here, um, the next slide, please. Uh, how we hear, again, another very brief uh, summation here. So basically sounds travel through the air as, as sound waves. Uh, the pinna again collects and channels these sound waves into the ear canal. Sound travels down the eardrum and, and vibrates the eardrum. Uh, vibration of the eardrum causes movement of the middle ear ossicles, or again, the, the tiny acicular chain that we talked about. So the farthest inward of those ossicles, again, the stapes is connected to the, the anterior ear of the fluid-filled cochlea. Uh, and as the stapes moves back and forth, this results in a, a pumping motion. Uh, and that motion causes movement of a, or a wave of fluid inside of the cochlea. Again, the cochlea is fluid-filled. That fluid movement activates the frequency of specific structures that line the cochlea. And movement of these structures interacting with the tiny hair cells results in a, a neural transmission or a signal which travels out of the cochlea through the auditory nerve. So the signal continues up to the brain to be processed as sound. So don't worry, there's, there's not gonna be a test afterwards, but I just kinda wanted to tie this in a little bit when we were talking about all these structures and, and basically how the, the ear functions. It's an enormously complex system and, and, uh, and I uh, appreciate you listening to my, my brief summation of there. Um, in terms of auditory disorders, uh, the next slide. I'll just go a few, a few of these that we see a lot. I'll break it down uh, also by the outer, middle, and inner ear for today's discussion. Uh, so some of the outer ear disorders include, we do see quite, quite a bit, the ones that, that come to mind or that we see probably more than others would be earwax impaction in the ear canal. So impacted earwax, your ear cerumen or earwax that occurs naturally, it has some good properties, but sometimes it can accumulate to the point that it blocks the ear canal. And that's, that can be a, a source of problem in the outer ear. Um, also other objects uh, creep in there sometimes, pieces of hearing aids. Um, believe it or not, I heard a story last week about someone sticking a paper clip in their ear. Uh, you know, uh, bugs, you know, there are things that get in the ear canal um, that, that create problems. Uh, sometimes we also deal with swimmer's ear, external otitis, we call that a bacterial infection in the ear canal. Also, there are some congenital conditions whereby there's an abnormally small ear canal or possibly the absence of an ear canal opening. Um, trauma is also something we see where uh, there may be a perforated eardrum, damage to the eardrum from loud sounds or objects or some kind of a force that damaged it. Uh, so all of these conditions of the outer uh, can often result in you know, hearing loss, tinnitus, fullness, pain, and some balance problems from time to time. Uh, some of the middle ear disorders uh, would be a middle ear infection. So infection in that middle ear cavity where fluid has accumulated, infection has started, usually as a result of the eustachian tube not functioning. The eustachian tube is a, a ventilation tube for the middle ear. And when that blocks, it causes a lot of those issues. Also, there are growths in the, in the middle ear that occur sometimes, a cholesteatoma or glomus uh, jugulari tumor, if you, if you run across those terms. Uh, that can occur, again, trauma that damages the chain of ossicles in the middle ear from loud sounds, objects and force again. These can also result in hearing loss, you know, the same, same symptoms, tinnitus, pain, fullness, some balance problems. And then we get down to the inner ear, some of the things we see there, mostly in this clinic, a lot of sensory or sensory neural hearing loss uh, from noise exposure, uh, prolonged noise exposure, and sometimes acoustic trauma where there was a blast that did some damage. Uh, sometimes we see uh, high drops as a condition of a abnormal fluid pressure in that cochlea. Uh, aging, or what we term presbycusis, uh, we, see, we see that in the clinic. Um, damage or growth to the eighth nerve, sometimes there may be tumors on the eighth nerve of the auditory nerve that can cause issues. And then uh, 
sometimes are toxic medications, medications that some folks take, um, depending on several issues there, but sometimes that can lead to hearing loss as well, sensory oral hearing loss. So again, um, it doesn't take, it's a very sensitive system. It doesn't take much to provide some symptoms. So this too, you might get some fullness. Again, tinnitus, balance disorder. Uh, so in terms of tinnitus uh, specifically, so tinnitus, that's the first thing that usually comes out is a tinnitus or tinnitus. So I guess that it depends on how you want to say it, but that's, uh, that's the first question usually people ask me. It really doesn't matter. So it's either one of those, but uh, symptoms are, um, you know, persistent or constant or sometimes intermittent ringing sensation that you hear it could be one or both ears. It can vary in, uh, in uh, degree of pitch or loudness or described in many different ways as far as the type of sound that it is, is it buzzing, rushing, uh, hissing, you know, it's a, a lot of different descriptors. They're roaring sometimes. Uh, some possible contributing factors would be age-related hearing loss, uh, prolonged ha hazardous noise exposure, again, acoustic trauma, uh, any of the previously discussed disorders I was talking about earlier. And as I mentioned, they, a lot of those can cause tinnitus, tinnitus. Um, head and neck injuries, some medications, uh, temporomandibular joint disorders, TMJ, that's where the, there's an issue with where the jaw bone meets the facial bone. Um, that can cause ringing in the ears sometimes. Uh, an acoustic nerve, nerve tumor, tumor we talked about, and then sometimes in some cases even diet um, can affect ringing in your ears. Prevalence of tinnitus, so affects approximately 15 to 20 percent of the population generally. Uh, the National Center for Rehabilitative Auditory Research um, studied 900 veterans with tinnitus, found likely uh, the likelihood of screening positive for PTSD, depression, or anxiety was increased for those with moderate, severe, or very severe tinnitus. So it can definitely have some effects on uh, behavioral health as well, no question. Uh, it's also known to contribute to fatigue, stress, uh, sleep problems, concentration problems, uh, depression, anxiety, headaches, uh, problems with work and family life. An evaluation for tinnitus may include uh, an audio, an audio, excuse me, audiologic exam. So uh, an, an audio eval through audiology. Uh, also an assessment of uh, the risk factors for tinnitus. Some of the things that you may uh, that may affect you that are contributing to it, as we mentioned earlier. Also, it may include a medical examination by a ear, nose, and throat physician, which is something we. A lot of times we do like to do as a precautionary measure in, in most of these cases. And then an ENT physician may refer it up uh, you know, to, to a different specialty, possibly you know, neuro, neurology or neurotologist, depending on what their concern is. There may be uh, uh, possible imaging studies through uh, radiology that would want to be, that, that you might want to have done. It, again, it depends on a lot of that depends on what the ear, nose, and throat physician is concerned about when we refer someone for tinnitus to him. So um, there may be other specialties involved uh, after the ENT. The treatment options for tinnitus uh, include, you know, assessing and reversing um, or mitigation of the risk factors that we discussed, if able. Some of those things can be turned around, diet, uh, not exposing yourself to noise, uh, some medications to see if there's some of that that could, that could assist. Uh, there are also noise suppression techniques with competing sounds that sometimes through just desktop devices for white noise or possibly um, features on more hearing aids that uh, emit noises to uh, as a competing signal. Uh, and also counseling. There's uh, a few out there. There's tinnitus retraining therapy, which has been around for a while. There's also um, there's also something known as cognitive uh, behavioral therapy, which is, is what's being done a lot these days through progressive tinnitus management uh, programs and tinnitus education classes. So there are things that, that are very helpful, have been found to be very helpful as far as counseling. Um, on that note, I, I always like to say, you know, it's critically important that all evaluations and treatment be administered by properly trained and licensed healthcare professionals who specialize in the evaluation and treatment of hearing loss and, and tinnitus disorders. So that's 
very important to remember that. And so I'd like to, uh, I've mentioned balance a little bit. Uh, I'd like to touch on this for a second, although it's it's a rather complex topic, a very important topic. It's I feel it's a little beyond the scope of today's discussion and time constraints. Um, perhaps we could do that as a different um, presentation one day. Um, very, very uh, broad topic and again, very, quite important. Um, but uh, re regarding causes and contributing factors of balance, I'll just say today that um, you know it presents a very potentially a very challenging set of issues and can sometimes involve a complex evaluation process to rule out the non-contributing factors. So it's how a lot goes into figuring out the cause of that by ruling out a lot of other uh, things that could possibly cause it. Uh, I'd highly recommend that you seek a medical, medical exam by your primary care doctor and also uh, ear, nose, and throat physician if you're experiencing any signs or symptoms of dizziness, spinning, vertigo, uh, positional instability, or any kind of visual anomalies. So um, again, I think we, we could co cover, this, uh, cover this as a different topic, and I'd be very interested in, in doing that as well. So um, the, you know, evaluating physicians for balance disorder, you know, they, they may recommend additional exams with other specialists also to further rule out your non-contributing conditions and factors in pursuit of uh, an accurate diagnosis. And the treatment is uh, quite varied. It'll depend on the actual nature and the type and the cause of that condition. So uh, next topic, uh, next slide, I think I may have skipped one or another, my apologies. We're going to go down to um, audiologic exam and hearing evaluation. And that's number six. Okay. So a thorough audiologic exam conducted by an audiologist generally consists of a review of any previous records that are relevant, um, a very thorough case history discussed with the patient caregivers. Uh, otoscopy, which is looking uh, in the ear canal, around the ears, uh, structures, uh, audiometric testing, which consists of pure tone testing, uh, presenting tones through air conduction and bone conduction. We're plotting these um, to assess, you know, how loud we're having to turn up sounds for the patient to be barely able to detect it. We call that a threshold. So we'll plot that on an audiogram, either in a graphic form or a table format. Uh, we'll do uh, speech testing for word recognition ability to assess a you know, percentage of your word recognition ability um, and quiet. And this is all done in a, in a uh, test booth. Uh, we also like to do admittance testing, which is an eval of middle ear function and other middle ear uh, structures and features processes uh, that occur in that middle ear cavity. So that's, that's pretty much the testing protocol there. Uh, We'll then review and discuss the results of the evaluation with uh, the eval with the patient, and uh, we'll review and discuss the plans or recommendations for what's next as far as a referral or possible uh, possibly uh, amplification. So, uh, next slide, please. All right. So. Referring to the previous discussion of outer, middle, and uh, inner ear disorders, you know, we're, we're trying to rule out things there to make sure we're not ha don't have any concerns for pathology. So we'll review all the information and results of the data from the evaluation that we just did, and and we'll determine the need for a medical referral of any potential medical pathology, such as again those we discussed. Um, depending on the results of the condition. Uh, a referral may be made to primary care, uh, ear, nose, and throat uh, physician, again, possibly neurology or other specialty as, uh, as deemed appropriate to investigate anything that's, um, that's standing out. So in this regard, a you know, primary goal in the scope of practice for audiology is to assist uh, the patient and providers through recommendations to help facilitate uh, appropriate evaluation and treatment of conditions. Um, that might need, that would need a medical referral. It's a big part of what we do. Uh, so next slide for hearing aids.
Okay, so the net, yeah, considering hearing aid amplification. Uh, so once we've you know, we've done the evaluation, we've ruled out uh, any other need or any further need for a medical referral. All concerns for other pathologies have been addressed and everything's good. We'll begin assessing the need and desire for hearing aid amplification. So I say need and desire because we can recommend hearing aids based on hearing loss. We recommend them based on um, also the needs and the desires of the patient and the family. So. Um, you know, what kind of communication issues are there? Um, how, what is the degree of the hearing loss? Uh, how is it impacting your daily life and functioning? And uh, we can go through that a lot of times and, and, and still the patient you know, may not be ready. So a lot of times they're, uh, they may even, they, they'll, they'll say, okay, thank you very much. They just kind of wanted to know what the condition was what the hearing loss was. They oftentimes go home and think about it, discuss it with their family, and then they come back and we're we're fitting hearing aids. So that's a big part of what we do as well as counseling patients on you know how much is this loss, uh, trying to uh, discuss with them you know what what are their needs and how's how's the hearing loss affecting them on a daily basis in their um in their daily routines. Uh, so if the patient opts for hearing aids and we're discussing hearing aid make model styles, uh, helping them with the selection of hearing aids. There's many types of hearing aids for a lot of different needs. Uh, so then we get that ordered and we set them up for a fitting appointment. They come back and then we're actually uh, fitting the hearing aids on them, taking them through an orientation, taking them through programming sessions to meet targets, You know, going through all the things that we do for uh, best practices and evidence-based uh, procedures to fit the hearing aids. Um, and then we will do a follow-up process. And a lot of that follow-up uh, is as needed. Sometimes we'll do, depending on what the situation is, uh, they may uh, come back as a scheduled appointment for a follow-up or they may come back just as they need to. And that's determined at the time of the fitting. So uh, very important here in wrapping this discussion up is I'm gonna start uh, with the Next slide is uh, number nine. So the importance of hearing health, effective communication, and staying connected. This is kind of what it's all about in the audiology and you know, communication world. Um, hearing loss affects approximately 37.5 million Americans age 18 and over, including more than half of those over the age of 75. Uh, hearing loss can contribute to increased difficulties carrying out routine daily activities, such as working, shopping, uh, conducting business, interacting with physicians and caregivers. Uh, it can hinder efforts to remain socially engaged, often contributing to increased feelings of isolation and depression, uh, depression and uh, particularly in the elderly. Um, hearing aids also, or excuse me, hearing problems are also the most prevalent service-connected disability among veterans. So there's a lot of uh, incidents of hearing loss and high prevalence out there in, in the community in general. Um, Hearing health is important because evaluation and proper treatment of auditory disorders is beneficial for the, for the prevention of its potentially hazardous and debilitating medical conditions. Uh, a lot of those things we discussed, uh, you know, as far as infections and uh, eighth nerve growth, that's pretty serious, you know, it could be pretty serious conditions if, they're, if they go untreated. So also fitting and use of hearing aid amplification contributes to improve hearing and communication ability, and this contributes to increase connection and engagement with others, thereby reducing the risk of isolation and feelings of loneliness and depression. So it's, uh, there's a lot to that, and we see it all the time in the clinic. Um, people happy to, and thanking us for the hearing aids, it's, it's just kind of reconnected them with people. Uh, otherwise, you may um, see other situations where they're just, they 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 just kind of give up. Hearing is too difficult, and they and they're just become less and less engaged. So in that that in that aspect is very important. So, um, so in closing, I'd like to thank everyone again for uh, this great opportunity to meet with you all. Uh, it's been a great pleasure. I'll also be very happy to uh, answer any questions you have at the end of today's presentation, and I'll stick around. Um, towards the end uh, following you know, Mr. Marconi's discussions. So again, thank you so much, everyone, and uh, have a great rest of your day.
Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Truelock. And uh, I love it that you ended on that slide with the, uh, the yarn and just um, it, it presented a visual of just how important um, hearing is with that, as you say, that social connectivity and um, preventing, you know, depression, isolation, um, cognitive impairment, things like that. And that was one of our success stories, as I uh, alluded to at the start of the, the introduction about these coffee connections. Um, we have a regular at our St. Pete Coffee Connection and um, Tony, who you'll hear from presently, worked to get his uh, disability and hearing aids through the VA. And so at our last Coffee Connection, I'm talking you know, on the other side of the room and just talking with um, the veterans near me. And all of a sudden I hear Michael, um, one of our veterans pop up from the other side of the room. And he's like, I got my hearing aids, you know, I can hear you now. Um, and it just, it was a fun moment that um, we've been working when uh, Tony specifically has been working to get him connected, um, get the, the resources he needs to um, erase that isolation and, um, Yes, that was just a great success story of um, community partners and collaboration and, and connecting these veterans who oftentimes don't understand that their service um, exposures um, can potentially contribute to some of their healthcare conditions and that they may qualify for, you know, healthcare services and, and disabilities. So, yeah. So um, I would like to uh, go ahead and introduce Tony Marconi. He's um, the veteran, serve, um, veteran claim supervisor here at the Bay Pines location for FDVA. And he's going to talk to us about um, filing for a disability claim, which can be a lot of red tape. And um, we certainly recommend having a professional walk you through that uh, process. So Tony, if you'd like to introduce yourself and we'll jump right in. Sure, thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank Empath Health and Trudy Beeler for inviting me to give this presentation on how to file a claim for hearing loss and tinnitus. Uh, I am the supervisor at the Florida Department of Veterans Affairs Office at Bay Pines. I am also a veteran. I served 20 years in the Army, so and I do suffer from hearing loss and tinnitus. Uh, it is, so it is near and dear to my heart to assist veterans uh, file their claim for these conditions. We have next slide, please. Okay. So there are over 4 million veterans, uh, disabled veterans of those over a million have uh, hearing loss and over 2 million have tinnitus. It is uh, one of the most prevalent uh, service connected disabilities uh, for our veterans. Uh, there are many, many more out there who have not even filed for those disabilities. So those are the ones we're trying to reach. Uh, next, please. When you file a claim for hearing loss, uh, the VA will rate each patient uh, on a case-by-case -case basis for hearing impairment, meaning they're gonna rate you, they're not gonna compare you to the previous veteran that they just rated. They don't do that, they will only rate it, rate you on the merits of your claim. Uh, it, is rated, it is granted on the degree of hearing damage and connection to service. Remember, any claim that you file for disability has to be related to your military service or it is a secondary condition to a primary service connected uh, condition. Next, please. Hearing loss can be rated from zero to 100%, meaning zero, 10, 20, all the way up to 100, depending on the severity of the hearing impairment. Tinnitus, on the other hand, is rated only at 10%. VA grants or denies, if it's granted, it's at 10%, that is the highest by law. That being said, I have seen three veterans in the last six years who've actually had a rating of 0% for tinnitus, which was kind of baffling, but they were old ratings. So we had to file a claim to get that increase to 10%, which they were able to get. Next, please. So to file a claim, you're gonna need a current diagnosis, Proof that the disability occurred during active duty. This is the connection to your military service. And a nexus, that's the link of the diagnosed disability to your military service. Next, please. 
So you need to gather your evidence and you want to start with a hearing exam. Uh, many veterans that I see aren't sure if they have hearing loss or it's been years since they've had one and we'll oftentimes recommend getting a, a hearing exam. Now, if you're going to do a hearing exam, you want to get the, the Maryland CNC test or the Puritone Autometric test, because that is what the VA is going to use when you go for your compensation and pension examination for your hearing and tinnitus uh, claim. Tinnitus, there is no, no exam like you can for hearing loss, so it's going to be based on your reported symptoms. Uh, so you need to see a doctor, you need to seek treatment, and you've got to get diagnosed for tinnitus. Next, please. You can write personal statements. You can collect buddy statements describing your activities in the military that would have impacted your hearing. Uh, those, are, those can pre be useful. The VA does look at those. Uh, a statement from your spouse who you've been married to since you came in service can attest to the fact that you have, have hearing loss. And so that it's well worth getting as part of your evidence collection. You wanna use your service records, your service treatment records to prove the origin of your hearing loss and tinnitus. Next, please. If you are filing your claim at the time that you are discharged, you wanna be sure that your medical records reflect a diagnosis in here of hearing loss and or tinnitus. That is the best time to file your claim when you're coming out of service because it's gonna be in your military medical records. You run into problems later on in life when you decide to file uh, for hearing loss or tinnitus because you're gonna need that nexus, linking your current hearing loss and tinnitus to your military service. So again, I'll say it, uh, service members getting out now, you wanna be sure before you get uh, discharged be sure you see your doctor and you get your exam done and get it noted in your records that you have hearing loss and tinnitus. Next, please. After you have your evidence, you're ready to file your claim. So you wanna see your service organizations such as the American Legion, Disabled American Veterans, uh, the VFW. Uh, you can go to your county veteran service office. You can go to your state veterans affairs department for assistance in filing your claim. Unlike attorneys or claims agents, uh, those organiz uh, organizations do not charge a fee. So I would start there first. See us, American Legion, see the county. We're, we're happy to assist you and it's free of charge. Next, please. After you file your claim, the VA is gonna request your service records, any VA records if you're being treated at the VA, in any identified civilian records that you list on the appropriate forms when you file your claim. Once they have that information, they're going to schedule an audiology compensation and pension examination. This is to determine the level of uh, severity and to obtain a medical opinion from the examiner. Once the VA has everything and that exam has been completed, then they'll sign, assign a, a rating to your claim. Next, please. Hearing loss and tinnitus are currently rated separately. So you can get two ratings, one for hearing loss and one for tinnitus. The average hearing loss rating for veterans is 10%, while many more get a 0% rating. Tinnitus is rated at 10%. Most of the veterans that I see are rated at either 0% or 10%. I've seen a handful that are rated at uh, well above that, uh, reaching up to 100%. On the other hand, I also see veterans who are denied hearing loss because the VA says uh, it's normal for VA purposes, but they are granted tinnitus. I see that quite often too. Next, please. So after you you get granted later on as your hearing gets worse and your tinnitus, you can file for increases. Any veterans who are granted at least 0% for their hearing loss can file for an increase as their hearing gets worse. And it needs to be a lot worse because it's pretty difficult 
just to go from 0% to 10%. However, uh, when your tinnitus gets worse, there is no increase because as I said earlier, 10% is the highest by law. However, if you can have secondary conditions that are caused by tinnitus and or hearing loss, and so you can make a claim for that. Next, please. Hearing loss can cause secondary conditions such as vertigo, anxiety, depression, and other conditions. A few secondary conditions caused by tinnitus are migraine headaches, anxiety, and depression. And I have actually seen veterans and assisted them with their claims for secondary conditions that have had these. Uh, they'll come in, my tinnitus has gotten so worse and I'm having problems, I'm depressed all the time. And if they have not been to mental health, we'll, we'll suggest that they get down to mental health get a diagnosis linking it to the tinnitus and then file their claim. Next, please. So yeah, you need that, that nexus linking that secondary condition to your hearing loss or tinnitus before you file that claim. Because if there is no link, your claim will most likely be denied. Next, please. We also look at the uh, hearing loss and tinnitus as a way to get into the VA for healthcare. Uh, there are many veterans who are apply for health care, they're over the th income threshold and are denied health care by the VA. So when they come over to see us, we'll, we'll start talking about hearing loss and tinnitus. If they fit the profile for that, we'll file a claim and if successful and the veteran is granted at least 10%, then the veteran has their foot in the door for health care. And that has worked for, for some of the veterans that we have seen. Mm. See. Next, please. So that's that's the down and dirty of filing a claim with for hearing loss and tinnitus. Of course, there's a lot more that goes into that. Uh, if you want more information about filing a claim for those conditions, you can contact us at uh, the Bay Pines VA. We're located in room 117, building 22. We're open Monday through Thursday from 7.30 to 3 and Friday from 7.30 to 2. You can also give us a call on the phone numbers listed right here or give us an email and we'll be uh, happy to assist you. Uh, next, please. Uh, there's my contact information if you'd like to get a hold of me. Uh, other than that, I'm, I'm done because it's, it's real quick, very simple. Like I said, a lot more goes into it. And you'll need to see us for, for more information about that. Thank you very much. And thank you everyone for your service. Thank you so much, Tony. Um, yes, I, I can attest that um, we, in our coffee groups that we've, we've done together, um, we've successfully connected some, some veterans into the healthcare system as well as into the disability claim portion. Um, I think sometimes what we tend to see is folks have attempted a claim in the past and been told no, but their health care, or in this case, their hearing may decline. Um, so it's, I always encourage people to reach out to uh, a veteran service officer like Tony or Pinellas County Veteran Services and uh, re-engage in the conversation. If there's been changes in your health care condition, um, legislation is always changing. Um, so it's, it's always prudent to, to revisit these um, opportunities if you've had a denial in the past. Um, and I think that's something that, you know, in our conversations with these veterans out in the community, and Tony, you shared some statistics, you know, over 1 million veterans with hearing loss, over 2 million with tinnitus, but there's still more out there that we, we haven't connected to. So as community providers or, you know, neighbors or family members that um, care about a veteran, um, when we're noticing these changes in hearing or complaints of ringing or tinnitus, um, I think it's just really important for all of us to not just presume it's a, a, a typical sign of aging. If there's been military service, it could be through service-connected exposures. And I just wanted to, to kind of go down that pathway a little, seeing as we have a little time. 
Um, and certainly if anyone does have specific Q&A, please put that into the Q&A box and we'll have our professionals answer that. But could you, Dr. Trulock or Tony, talk about some of the different um, uh, service exposures that we see. One of them that comes up in the coffee group is, you know, serving in the Air Force or serving, you know, in the Navy on, on the carrier ships and, um, you know, that constant kind of exposure. So could you share for those of us that aren't in professional healthcare providers, but we're talking with our friends, family, service members, um, and kind of give us an idea of potentially their types of exposures that may be contributing factors to a successful hearing loss or tinnitus disability claim? Uh, yeah, I can answer some of that. Mm -hmm. um, one of the first things we'll ask a veteran is, is what'd you do in the military? I worked on the flight deck, the aircraft mechanics. I was on the flight deck of a, a carrier my whole four years that I was in. Well, that, that loud noise from that, those jet aircraft does have an impact on the hearing loss and, of course, tinnitus, so we'll, we'll file a claim for that. Uh, talk to infantrymen, so they're exposed to all sorts of uh, loud noises that would impact their hearing. I, I do know that the VA has a, has a list of military occupational specialties that they're, they're uh, listed as uh, high probability, moderate, or low. Like myself, I was an MP for 20 years. Uh, that list shows that the military police are moderate for hearing exposure, for hearing damage. Where an infantryman, that's high. Uh, if you worked in the engine room in the Navy, you know, you're going to be exposed to a lot, of, a lot of loud engine noises. So I've seen veterans who fit that bill get granted. I would uh, I definitely agree with that, uh, Tony. It's, a lot of times I, I, it, it entails that they just kind of think back exactly what they were doing. And we, we discussed this a lot with veterans. So it could be anything as, um, that you may not first consider, like a gentleman the other day worked in a loud computer room for years. You know, So back, back then, you're talking about a room full of computers, big, big size computers. Um, and being around something like that all day is very insidious. You, you may not think that, of that as like being next to a, a loud 140 decibel jet engine, but, but on a daily basis, that can have a big impact. So uh, even um, regular shipboard spaces, I was in the Navy, I was aboard ships. Um, there's a lot of areas aboard ships uh, that are loud just because of the way the ducting works and um, things like that. So it's... Um, you know, of course, as, as Tony was saying, the flight line, even even folks who worked close to the flight line, if it was every, again, that daily exposure over a long period of time can take its toll and cause hearing loss and, uh, and tinnitus, for sure. Great. Well, thank, I, th I think that helps, um, like I say, those of us who don't work in you know, the medical circles or are not familiar with these claims as we're meeting veterans and and they're sharing their service stories and then they share that nugget of information that they they do have hearing loss or tinnitus um you know we can maybe advocate for that follow-up conversation with you know the vsos and and such to just see if there's a potential a potential for a claim so thank you for sharing those examples um there's I got something else, Trudy. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the veterans that I've seen, um, they've come in and said, yeah, they got, they, they were told that they had to go to compensation and pension exam to schedule an exam for hearing. And so the, they, they referred over here and I start talking to them and ask them, so what, how this lead, lead you to us? Well, I went to audio, the audiology clinic to get my hearing test and I told them that I was going to, I'm filing a claim. Uh, I counsel veterans, don't mention claim if you're gonna go get a hearing exam because they're gonna to refer to you to the compensation and pension exam. If you wanna get your hearing check, get a check, great. Don't mention the claim. Um, because the veterans I've seen, they've come over here storming and angry that they were uh, told to go over here, then over to us. So we tell them, don't, don't mention anything about filing a claim because it's not gonna work. Just go in there, 
get your hearing taken care of, which is the primary concern, and then come back and see us and we'll discuss a claim. Get that taken care of, but get your hearing taken care of first. You know, get into some classes for treatment for tinnitus, and then come back and see us. Yeah. And we'll talk about what you need to do. I definitely agree with you on that too. It's sort of a um, it's sort of a different side of the house, if you will, um, diagnostic audiology for. Uh, the veterans healthcare system and medical referrals versus, and it's not versus, that's not a good terminology. We work hand in hand with the, with the benefits office, um, but it is, it, it's a, a different, a uh, uh, little bit of a different process when you're actually uh, seeking a compensation audio, audiogram, which Tony alluded to, they, they use different word lists. It's a, it's a different process where they're um, assessing it. Um, on a different basis. We're, we're more on the medical side of the house. Uh, we're addressing uh, disorders uh, and getting them treated and evaluated and fitting hearing aids. And the compensation pension office is, um, from my understanding, um, it's uh, for an evaluative process for ratings. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, great. Well, thank you for clarifying and, and sharing that tip. So. Great. Does uh, anyone on the line, we, we still um, have some participants still logged in here. Um, I, I saw one or two drop off, but um, if anyone has a question, unfortunately, uh, for those that joined a little late, our chat function is, is not up and running today, but the Q&A box is there. Um, so certainly feel free to, to drop a question in. Um, while we're waiting for any feedback from participants, um, this might be one for you, Tony. Um, I recently spoke with a spouse, uh, her veteran husband has hearing loss um, uh, and was told to write a statement, um, but there's uh, cognitive impairment. So how, how does one go about getting a nexus statement or a buddy statement um, to help bolster up the claim um, or obtaining medical records. Is that something that you help folks with or you guide them through that process? Yeah, we can we can discuss on, on how they can obtain their medical records, uh, if they're civilian or VA or military. Uh, you don't have to obtain your, your VA records for a claim because when you file the claim, Veterans Benefits Administration will contact Veterans Healthcare Administration to obtain those records. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to provide VA records for your claim. VA will get it. There are ways to to get VA have VA authorize uh, have authorization to request their civilian records. If they're needing a nexus, we'll talk to them. And a lot of times, they're going to have to go on the outside to see a civilian audiologist to get a a nexus statement done, linking the diagnosed condition to their military service. And we discuss how with veterans uh, at length because they need to provide that audiologist uh, their records, their DD-214, uh, any VA audiology records, the, your audiology records from service. Because uh, they need to have a complete picture before they write that nexus because that VA examiner during the compensation and pension exam is going to have access to all those records. So you want to put that outside audiologist on the same footing as that VA examiner. And sometimes vets will do that. And, and again, that's at their own cost. VA won't pay for that. Some do it, some don't, and they just want to file their claim and we file their claim. We help them the best we can. Uh, we might have a system write a statement. So, okay, what'd you do in service? And we'll craft their statement for them uh, if we need to. Uh, if uh, we talk to them about getting a, a spouse's statement or a family member statement, we'll tell them what they need to do for that. Uh, buddy statements, it's, you know, hey, contact some. You're still, still in contact with some of your buddies from your last unit. Some people maintain those, that contact with their friends from their past units, you know, even 50 years ago. So get them to write you a statement on, you know, what was going on. You know, what'd you do in the military? You know, how you were exposed to live fire exercises. You were 
uh, in combat together, you know, uh, things like that. And uh, some of them are able to get those those buddy statements, and then you know we put it together with the, their claim and send it in. Great. Wonderful. So the chat feature is up and working. Um, I don't see any um, questions or feedback from the audience. Um, any closing remarks from either of our presenters today? Um, tips, tricks, success stories. Um, it's always nice to hear a success story. Tony, you've shared a couple. Um, Dr. Truluck, you, you shared a couple as well. But if there's anything else that you'd like to, uh, to share with the, the group before we depart for the day would love to hear from you i'd like to close with a couple of things so uh as far as access to our services of the bay pines va uh, audiology uh, network we have audiology services at the bay pines clinic uh, palm harbor sarasota uh, bradenton and here in lee county mm -hmm. we also have some remote um, care mm -hmm. offered at sebring and naples um, and uh assuming that the eligibility has been granted and worked out and, 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 and that side of the house has been taken care of, there, uh, there's no actual consult required for hearing exams for either, either of these clinics. There's a consult required for some of our ballot services, uh, but not for, you know, getting a hearing test through us to, you know, to discuss hearing issues and communication problems. And I can, uh, if you'd like, uh, Ms. Beeler, I can send you that contact information for for each of those clinic sites. Um, and I'd also like to say that, uh, you know, a lot of times we, there's some reluctance to getting hearing aids because of someone else's less than good experience that, you know, that we hear about. We'll say, oh, my, my, grand, my father had these and he had these problems and my, my grandfather had these. And, and I'll just tell you, it's a different time for fitting hearing aids. Uh, it's the best time to be fitting hearing aids, I find the technology and the advances in the hearing aid amplification and the way we fit them has you know, never been better. The products are really good. We have a lot of good successful outcomes. So I, I'd encourage you to, if you're having these communication problems, hearing loss issues, tinnitus, any, any of those other issues we discussed, you know, definitely um, let your doctor know, your ENT doctor, or definitely uh, come and see us as well. We'll be glad to help you. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, we do have a question in the chat. Um, who does the Maryland tests? Tony, you had referred to a couple of uh, specific tests. Do you know who does those? Well, I know the compensation and pension exam will administer that test when they do their, their exam. Matter of fact, when I read a rating decision, they actually mention it in the rating decision. Okay, so a veteran yes. wouldn't seek an outside Maryland test or the the other if, one before if, the... if they're looking if they're looking for somebody to, on the outside. Uh, I do know of an audiologist that does, and they can contact me. Okay, and I'd be happy to provide them the information. Perfect. I just wanted to circle back really quickly to eligibility to the, to the VA healthcare system because this is something that we do see a lot when we're out and about working with veterans in the community. Um, is maybe they've applied for healthcare in the past um, and been told no for income or they just didn't meet eligibility criteria or they've maintained their own healthcare insurance through an employer, whatnot. Um, oftentimes we do hear and see veterans kind of deferring um, seeking support through the VA because their brothers or sisters uh, need it more than them or they're not as bad off as some of the other veterans in the community so they maintain their own health insurance. I'm a huge advocate to to initiate that on that conversation with eligibility um, and that would either be going into one of the, the um, clinics or the hospital here at Bay Pines to the eligibility office or um, talking through the switchboard to the eligibility office and start that conversation because we have seen that. Um, I've seen that from our coffee groups where uh, veterans were denied eligibility um, at one time and their circumstances and their health have changed and then when they revisit that scenario uh, they are successful. So um, you know we, we we have these situations, especially as hospice providers, um, where families 
um, they don't tap into the healthcare system that they're eligible for, and then they kind of leave things too late in the in the scheme of things, um, and they're you know, really limiting their accessibility to some of the wonderful programs and services that the VA provides, not only for the veteran, but also for the caregivers. So um, I don't know if, if either of you have anything to add to that, um, encouraging that, that eligibility conversation, but I, I think that's a, a big part of this today as well. Yeah, so veterans, if they haven't applied for health care, they need to get in and apply and find out. Uh, eligibility will review their, their income. And if you're a married veteran, they take into account your spouse's income. So a lot of times that could put you over the income threshold. Uh, if that happens and they need to come over and see us and we'll see about filing a claim or, or maybe there's a hardship. Uh, I've seen veterans where one year they were denied because they were making all this money. The next year, you know, they've had something has happened. They're now making less money and we counsel them to get over and refile. Uh, file for a hardship so they can look at their, their income of the current year because when you file, VA is looking at last year's income. If you're filing, filing today for healthcare, they're going to be wanting asking questions about your income from 2021. So the only way to find out is get in and, and apply. Right. And if they're successful, then we're able to dial them into the the audiology clinic and and the resources that Dr. Truelock shared. So it's it's all important information. And um, sometimes, as uh, friends and family members or caregivers of veterans, we have to be the cheerleader and and advocate for them to. To kind of dial in and tap into these resources. So, uh, I do have one question, Dr. Turlock. Are, are the audiology clinics still doing appointments, or now they've gone back to walk-in? It's a good question. Uh, thank, thank you for asking that. Um, we're still doing appointments for uh, examinations mm -hmm. and for hearing aid fittings. Uh, but as a matter of fact, <clears throat> starting uh, this coming Monday, we're going to be doing same day service for repairs, which is which is the veterans tend to really love that for obvious reasons. Uh, they can just come in and, and take care of problems they're having with their hearing aids um, rather than, you know, than waiting for just a, you know, a long time just for a quick fix of something we can do in the office. So um, uh, thank you for asking that. Yeah. So uh, at this time, we're still, again, appointments uh, for exams uh, and hearing aid fittings, but uh, same day service for repairs. And can, they, can a veteran just contact the audiology clinic directly or do they need to go through their primary care to schedule an appointment? Uh, for, you know, if they're already enrolled, um, they can just come in okay. to the walk-in clinic. Um, they can just come into the walk-in clinic uh, Monday through Friday, starts at 7.30 in the morning. So that's for an enrolled veteran who has, you know, hearing aids. Um, for exams, uh, it's a non-consult uh, clinic, so they can just walk up or contact us to make that appointment. Uh, there is one exception. Um, we do require a consult for vestibular balance testing because uh, Lee County just started doing balance testing. Uh, okay. Again, on a very limited basis. Um, I'm pretty sure that's consistent throughout the network um, mm -hmm. for audiology. Uh, but uh, yeah, they, they can just walk up and make the appointment for an exam. And of course, the fitting is dictated like when we do an exam, uh, we'll make the, the hearing aid orientation fitting appointment before they leave uh, on the date of that exam. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Trulock and Tony, for joining us today and sharing this uh, important and valuable information. Uh, for those of you who would like to re-listen to the recording today, um, we do. We obviously recorded the session, and we will have that up and available on our EmpathHealth.org/briefing uh, webpage, so that you can go back and listen to previous um, topics and recordings. 
Um, I'd like to thank all the veterans and service members on the line today for their service. Um, and thank you so much for, for joining us today. Next month, um, we will be talking about dementia and cognitive impairment of veterans and resources available through the VA as well as community providers for that important topic as well. So we hope that you can join us. I believe we're looking at August 24th. That is the fourth Wednesday of the month. Yes, August the 24th at noon. So I hope you can join us for that. Um, again, thank you, Dr. Trulock and Tony, and for everyone joining us today. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.